not right now. Okay, um, with that, uh, I will start up this uh, introduction. Uh, okay. it, uh, my name is Delmar Larson. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Brian Lishield. Uh, he's been working with us for a while. Uh, we've been uh, familiar with his uh, OER content for the past half a decade plus, uh, and very excited in order to work with him, uh, and is here to talk about uh, a handful of things that he's been doing on the LibreText project and motivation for OER in general. With that, I will let him um, start. Yeah, so I think Delmar is going to share some links in the chat. And so uh, I'm going to use this Google Slides. You can share the link to it. And I think you'll also share a link to my resource itself that I'll show you in a little bit as well. But um, my presentation today is mostly going to focus on the, uh, it's going to focus on the Libre text with embedded adapt questions. And so my first part of what I'm going to talk about here quickly this afternoon is kind of why I decided to do this and um, why why this was something I wanted to undertake. Uh, so I I had an OER like Delmar said for a while. Um, let me go ahead and move you guys at least on my screen so you're not blocking. Uh, I've I've had a, I had an OER for a while. I first created it in around 2010, and so I've done some survey work with it to understand what students' thoughts are on it. And one of the things that kind of stayed with me was some of what I'm gonna show you here. So you see, this is from an article in 2013 and you can go, as you get those shared with you, you can go access that article if you want to afterwards. But it, one of the questions we asked the students was, compared to my experience with a normal textbook and other courses I use, at that time I referred to the resource as the Flexbook. And so that's the resource that I created. And so there's a scale from one to seven, a Likert scale. And so they could answer anywhere from much less to much more. And they answered, you see, somewhere around a five for both my campus and online students. And so five means somewhat more than normal. So what does that translate to? So there was another question where it asked them to report how frequently they use the, the resource. And so here you see the same questions are asked whether it's never, less than one, once a month, once a month, once every two weeks, once a week, two, three times a week, and then more than three times per week are the questions. And so there's numbers you can see there, but what I really wanna highlight is this one. And so that's this, is that 40.5% of my campus students and 12.5% of my online students report using it every two weeks or less frequently. And that always stayed with me over a number of years that I thought about, that seems really bad. You know what I mean? Even though uh, the surveys were really positive about what they thought about the resource and how well it helped them learn. And so I was always interested in ideas on how to try to get them to engage with the, the resource more. And by engaging more, I believe they would learn more is kind of what the idea was. So some of the things that uh, led to some of the things I'm going to talk about today was I had an idea and there was a platform that was available that would allow me to execute on that idea. And um, so I was working with a grad student, uh, Erin Ward, who had a principal's college teaching class and she had a project she needed to complete for it. And so the idea that I came up with was what if we take my OER and we embed questions within it and we then can see how students do on those questions. And so there's an incentive for them to go and engage with the resource versus it just being a PDF or a, a non-interactive resource. And so what we did is I, I drafted 380 questions. And so Aaron worked on getting those embedded into that platform and getting everything into that platform as well and make sure that it was all set up. It was not open, but that platform was free for my students to use at that point in time. And so I was okay with utilizing it to get this functionality. The questions that were designed to be answered be quick to answer. So they're primarily multiple choice. So that way the, the number of questions isn't something that should be something that dissuades students from wanting to go forward because it's so time consuming. Students receive credit on one attempt uh, towards answering that question correctly. The reports are credit. They can see whether they answered it correctly or not. They get feedback on whether they do. And then they get feedback as well in the form of response on why it is correct. And then I generally had a set of questions that are due, that was generally by chapter. And those were mostly due somewhat, uh, most weeks, not every week as it worked out in the semester, but most weeks it did. 
So this was the extra credit scale. So I, since I was trying this and it was new, uh, I wasn't sure how it was going to be received, decided to do it for extra credit. And so I looked at what percent of those points they earned and they would earn this extra credit for completing those. So the first thing that I'm sharing here is this is reported frequency of use that we saw when we moved to this platform. And so you can see that there was a marked increase in the, the use when we moved to this interactive resource that had the questions within it. So you remember the campus students, I thought 40.5 students that were in this area, see in the campus students now there were zero in this case. I had a few in the online students, but still a lot of increase in the reported frequency of use. The other thing that I did want to share briefly from some of the research we've done, and again, this is published here, and so you can get the link off the slides that were shared, is this question we asked, what percentage of time they estimated that they spend in the platform answering questions and reviewing answers versus doing the things that we normally want them to go there to do, which is read. My resource has some embedded videos and other things within it that they could be also utilizing. And you see that they reported that the majority of their time was answering and reviewing answers to these questions. And so for some people, it might be discouraged by this. But from my point of view, this suggests that they were probably doubling the amount of time or more that they would have otherwise invested probably into engaging with that material. And so I hope that that would be a positive for their learning and outcomes. So here I'm showing a figure. Uh, one of the things we did look at is the percent questions that they got correct across all the chapters here. And so that's what you see in the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we have the course final grade. And so you can see we have campus students in purple, online students in green. We saw a similar trend where the students that got more of those questions correct tended to do better on the or didn't tend to do better in the final percentage of the grade that they earned or the percentage of points that they earned in the course overall. And then this was, uh, as we looked at that, we started to see some separation. And so we decided to look at those that earned 80% or more of the questions correct and compare those to the ones that got less than 80% of those correct. And so you can see that there was a pretty big difference in outcomes that we saw in that 87% of the, or there's 87% mean final percent grade in the, those that got 80% or greater of the questions uh, versus those that got less, it was a 70.9. And then there was a marked difference in the, the final grades that they earned, where you see that almost none of the students who um, got 80% or better correct got a D or F versus those that got less than 80%, it was much more mixed and very few get earned A's. And so that was one of the things that we were able to determine one of the things that we did take away from the research we conducted there. So uh, following that, ethically, I didn't feel like I could any longer make them extra credit. And also they were received well enough that I was comfortable doing that. And so this is showing a figure showing kind of what the assessment style is for the course now in that these are very low stakes um, questions that they have to answer here. So I have some in-class questions right now with how we're teaching with COVID. I have part of my students in person and part of them are online. And so they have some low stake questions there. They have Libre text questions that they can that they also contribute towards their grade. They are very low stakes. You see open book, mostly multiple choice, low stakes. I have some quizzes, which are open book. They're more exam-like questions. They're fairly short. And then I build them up to the exams as far as the assessment style. So I wanted to quickly just show this is what the um, this is the, how I allocate the points. To give you a sense, there's somewhere on the range of 580 points in the course. And so you can see that for a chapter or a section of questions, they earn up to one point. And so it's very low stakes. It's not really going to um, be something that's going to hurt them too much uh, one way or the other, but it is a, a, something that is a opportunity for them to learn. And it does impress upon them that they are expected to answer those questions. So following those, uh, following that, those steps, decided to even out the number of questions that are due, even if that didn't always perfectly align with chapters, it happened to be that there was some imbalance that in, in the number of questions that there were, where there were some chapters, sections where they have to answer quite a few more questions. So we tried to even that out some more. We also worked with LibreText to move the interactive resource to that platform. And so we used it for the first time this last summer. Uh, we embedded the questions for formative assessment for that summer and fall semesters. 
And then starting this semester now, we have both summative and formative assessment for the first time that's available using ADAPT. And then there's two versions of the resource. The summative and enabled version is only accessible to my students. So I wanna show what this looks like here now. And so um, there's two versions, as I said, there's a public vision version, and then there is the, the version that my students see. So the public vision version looks like this. And so I'm showing you what one of the sections looks like. And I think uh, Delmore, did you drop the link to that? Yes, you did into the chat. And so you can go and look at this if you want and see what the resource looks like. And so you can see that it has these embedded questions as you see here uh, that are kind of put through here. The idea being that they shouldn't have to read real long without having a question assessment that they can utilize. Or if they're here and they're not reading and they're going to answer questions that they are going to hit a question and be able to see the, the materials and resources around it that they can use to help them answer that question. And so that's the idea behind how the setup of the, the resource is. And so this is just an example of what one page looks like that I'm scrolling through here now. And so you can see that there's a number of questions. The design is to embed it within the page and not just put them all at the bottom to try to make sure the students are engaging with the, the page and the, the material and resources within it. So that's an example of what the public facing page looks like. I guess this is probably one of the best places to show um, what this uh, looks like as far as the students answer. And so we see that it says pancreatic lipase cleave SN1, SN3 fatty acids from triglycerides, leaving two monoglycerides and three fatty acids for uptake into enterocyte. I know none of you are nutrition people, uh, but anyone want to guess true or false that I can put in there? Why don't you go with true? Okay, so Delmar says true. So Delmar got it right. And so you can see this is how the questions work. And so it says true. And so two monoglyceride indicates that one S and two fatty acid is still bound to glyceride. And so you can see that uh, responded there. And so you get that feedback, whether they answered it correct or not, to help them understand why that question is correct or not correct in that way. So we also have the summative version. And so you see the summative version has single sign-on uh, employed. And so the students have to sign in with a uh, single sign-on. And so for my case, since I'm from Kansas State University, they sign in through Kansas State, and then they're able to get to this ADAPT system. And so I guess one of the things I should say, you see it says query here on the assessments. And the other thing I should say, these are H5P, which is a assessment type that's available. That's not LibreTech specific. It can be used in other applications as well. But you notice that on this page, now it says adapt. And so what they've done is that Delmar and LibreTech have created this uh, assessment system that they now are embedding those questions within here. And now there is a grade book that goes behind it that allows us to capture whether students get those correct or not, and other information like when are they answering them and other details uh, that are similar. And so this is what my page looks like. This isn't what the students are gonna see a page looks more like what you see here. And it's gonna maybe tell them on top, like whether they answered the question and if they got it correct and things, but um, it's gonna mostly look like this. This is more what the instructors see here with a little bit larger and see, I can see statistics on how they did on that question within my page. And so this is what it looks like in, in the overall, um, Libre text with adapt embedded within the page itself. So on the back side, there then is uh, adapt. And so this is the adapt system. And so it is a assessment system itself. This is one application of embedding the adapt questions into a resource on Libre text. But here you can see this is my course within adapt that I've signed in. And so then these are all the different chapters or sections or subsections like I was referring to that are assigned to them. And so you can see these are the ones that are closed that should have been completed already that the students are working through. And you can see that there's an available date and when they're due. And then there's a set of questions that are within there. And then there's a grade book that is on the back side of this as well that um, gives you uh, or which collects whether they got it correct or not 
what response they provided and all the other sort of data that you would expect on this. And uh, Delmar and them are working on an LTI, which would connect the Canvas and other LMSs to uh, allow this to be something that would um, sync, you know, with the LMSs. Right now, I have to do a little bit of manual work to get the scores over into Canvas that fit the grading scale that I showed. I wanted to stop here and see if there's any questions or clarifications I could provide at this point. This is nice. You know, one of the things that I was particularly interested in uh, was to try to do a study in order to identify if you uh, if you make it so that students uh, <clears throat> compare and contrast how students, uh, the benefits of doing online homework via a separate app, like what's on the screen right now versus embedded directly in the book. And I, and I didn't do an aggressive scholarly search, but I couldn't really find any clear evidence out there, academic evidence to say, that one is better than the other, even though I believe fundamentally embedding questions into the book uh, forces students to engage with the material in the book and that's beneficial. Is that something that you have any information in order to address or is that something that I need to run a, a, a proper study on in order to? Uh, I don't know that I've seen anything. I can go back and try to double check, you know, our publication to see if my grad students did find something on that, but I don't remember. When, when we were publishing the paper about the, the research we did on this, there wasn't a lot out there, you know, on doing this sort of thing. I think mm -hmm. mostly because the technology has just not been available to do this sort of thing for very long. And so um, we might have to, we might be at a point where there needs to be more of an empirical study. You know what I mean? To look at whether there, there is a difference on whether it's embedded or not, like you're asking. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually quite interested in that. That's nice. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I'm, I just wanted to say I'm I'm really fascinated by this and I want to learn the like technical how to side of it. Um, I have to pop off for another meeting at one though, so I'm I'm assuming this will be recorded and I can watch the step by step kind of how to side later. Yeah. Perfect. I, and and I'm not going to go into the how to because that's still okay. Being Used out, I guess, a little bit um, on, on the Libre Text app part. And so that's something they're working through now. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yep. Yeah, and, and contact me um, afterwards, and uh, we will be setting up uh, more tutorials on how to go about doing these things because we're basically at the end of the beta phase testing of this stuff. So uh, things are going to be going live uh, for broad uh, usage uh, very soon. Yeah, so that, I guess the other thing I didn't say, my, my research has kind of been a prototype or beta, if you will. And so um, they've been doing development around making this sort of capability and functionality available. And so uh, I think it's very exciting. You know what I mean? That there's gonna be this that can be done on an OER platform. And so I think it's gonna be something that's gonna be a real game changer for a lot of people to be able to really elevate what they maybe would typically do for an OER. One other thing that I did want to share quickly about another feature that they do have available. And so I've been talking to Delmar quite a bit as we've been going through this process and they have this, um, they have a dynamic glossary or glossicizer, I think as he likes to refer to it. And I thought it was, so what it, what it is, I'll show you in a second, is the ability to be able to have um, hover boxes pop up with definitions on the OER page itself based off of a, a glossary that you compile. And so I've been utilizing this to be able to build out uh, on, to, on top of my OER because I know a lot of students struggle with the, the terminology that is used within my field and within my specific resource. And so my process of how I've gone about defining about 550 of these terms so far in my first seven chapters of the resource is that I, I basically go through a, a chapter or sections and I look to see you know, what terms I think should be defined within their using this feature. And then I've, I went through and I have gotten a number of links to openly licensed glossaries that I know are available that are within the types of things that might have terms that I'm going to be trying to define within them. And so 
one of the things I did through is I went through the LibreText bookshelves. It has a number of resources from other fields, which is good because some of the terms nutrition is an interdisciplinary field. And so a lot of things I'm defining are not unique to nutrition. And so I could utilize some of those definitions. Uh, wiki book glossaries were one of the other ones I used. And then another one that I've used for my specific field is National Cancer Institute has a nice glossary too. And so since it's a uh, uh, in each uh, national, it's a governmental website, it is public domain. And so I could utilize that. And so I have an Excel sheet, you know what I mean, where I work through uh, defining these. And so I pull up all those glossaries as I'm doing that. So I can kind of hit the one and look at the ones that I think might have definitions for what I'm trying to define. I utilize that. I've probably defined the majority, you know, myself, or I had definitions that I could utilize within them, but I, I have been utilizing those and it has worked fairly well from a workflow standpoint. So let me show you what this looks like. That's what the underlines are that you see on the page here. And so you see if I hover over it, it pops up a definition right there for the students uh, that, that can help define what those are. And so it, it's a nice uh, feature to really add on, you know, to an OER that really helps students understand what they're doing. If they want, they don't have to utilize it. And so, but it is a nice feature for them to be able to take advantage of. The only thing I can share to give you a sense, this is what my Excel sheet looks like. I'm not going to go too into the weeds here on how this works, but you see, I basically rattled through what the terms are that I wanted to find. Then uh, this is where I define it. And then you see, I come out here and I do, you know, link where I'm getting it from if I am using it from somewhere else. And so you can see for me, when I'm using this longer sheet, it helps me to highlight this column here so I can go and find where I need to put that in somewhat quickly as I'm moving through. But um, so this gives you a sense on, it's a, it's a fairly large, um, it's a large sheet that I'm put together. I know Delmar is working on the idea of making this that there might be a more internal glossary sort of lookup option that might be available within LibreText as well, but uh, that would build on if um, if I put all these definitions in that those would be available if they're you're looking up terms and things and so, but a very nice feature, you know, what I mean that I, I think will really help my students in particular with uh, their learning as they're utilizing the, the resource itself. Any questions at this point on glossary or other things that I've shared? So I'm, uh, I'm obviously a big fan of the glossary infrastructure uh, and we have a lot of uh, things that we wanna do in order to facilitate community curation of content. So people don't need to build glossaries for books from scratch. You don't have to go through the grunt work that Brian has got, gone through and, and is able to adapt conveniently from one book to another book. But the one thing that <clears throat> I've been particularly concerned about is, um, you know, for me, having all these underlines is, uh, is actually a little disturbing. <laughs> I, I, it it uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't resonate with my eye. Uh, I'm not sure and, and Brian mentioned that he doesn't have a problem at all uh, reading it. I'm not entirely sure if that is something that other students uh, have expressed. Uh, have you have you heard any students uh, say anything? Uh, I've never really queried my students, even though I use the system too. Uh, I I think since the 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 code, you know, what I mean, that puts the underlines in do enough, and I don't know that my students have been refreshing. It takes eight days or something, right after mm -hmm. that changes. <clears throat> I don't know how many of them have been inter interacting with it a lot, but I've not heard anything so far, you know, about the lines mm -hmm. or being distracting or anything in that way. Mm -hmm. And the option to turn it off will be on the sidebar um, at the same time that you could turn off the whole glossary, uh, which uh, if you want to be able to do that instead of just turning off half of it, uh, the, what you can see. Um, so I think this is really cool stuff uh, and, and you've done a great job uh, picking it up and running with it. I'm quite yeah. excited about that. Does anyone else have any questions? People are flies in the wall. Um, Brian, does your students um, utilize the um, the uh, food composition database to analyze their, their food? 
Not, not in my course. I'm more of an intermediate level nutrition. And so they do that a little bit more at the basic nutrition level. And um, also yeah. in a nutritional assessment course we have. And Delmar, is, your, is the Libre Tractor live yet or not? Yeah, actually, I'm putting the, uh, the link right there. So the Libre Tracker um, is... Uh, <clears throat> it's a joint project with uh, the California Community College, the Academic Center of the California Community College uh, system. Uh, and they uh, have uh, uh, built a, a super tracker alternative uh, that's freely available or will be freely available. Uh, so there's a link right there on it. If this is of particular interest to you, then contact me directly and I can tell you a little bit more about it. Um, I think it's ready to go live um, where you can go and have all the uh, features that the super tracker infrastructure uh, provided before it was taken down a few years ago. Um, if, if that's what you're, that's what you're, you're asking about. Um, yeah. 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 But um, it's, is it, is it a different, um, it's on a different part, platform apart from the Libra test or it's already integrated into the Libra? It's within, it's within the Libraverse, which is our term of all the eco, all the servers that are part of our umbrella. Um, uh, it, it is not currently set up in order to, to be connected to the single sign-on. So you log in and then you get access to it. So you have to have your own login for a Libra tracker. Um, but we'll address that uh, in, you know, uh, before summer or let's say definitely before the end of summer uh, or for it to be integrated. But right now you can, uh, you can get your account uh, onto it and then track all the uh, your consumption and do all the analysis and such that Super Tracker is, was able to do. At least that's my understanding of it by the people that, that built it, which are nutritionists. Um, I've actually never used it myself. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you. So feel free to take a look around and, and contact me if you'd like to have more information. Okay. I will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, any, are there any other questions? Uh, uh, Thank Brian. Are we missing anything, Brian? Is there any other beautiful nugget that you have to share? I don't think so. I think that was kind of what I wanted to show. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to take more time from people than what I, what I so hopefully help illustrate at least yeah. what what I've done and give an idea of some of the functionality that's coming available now within LibreText to kind of elevate resources beyond something that's static where you can get more interactive with having students answer assessments and then with adapt if you want to go more summative to get a sense and I you know I, I use I, I'm using a lot on trying to identify students for student success purposes and so I can use it somewhat predictively to get a sense on maybe who I need to reach out to uh, as well from some of the things I'm gathering from it. Yeah, that's the key point, or one of the key features associated with that, because you can basically identify uh, within the first week to week and a half the students that uh, will require intervention or at least some additional support in order to be able to uh, ensure that they don't uh, drop out of the class or fail the class. Um, and I think that's one of the key aspects that's going to be coupled into our analytics infrastructure um, that we'll be releasing later on this year using the information regarding how they interact with the book and such. Um, I think this is all really cool stuff, and this is just a manifestation of, um, of what I call the textbook of the future is to be able to make a more engaged resource uh, that is far more than what a conventional paper-based textbook that most of us grew up on uh, and uh, are comfortable with. This is great. Yeah, textbooks 2.0 here, Delmar, with the all-in thing. <laughs> 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 yeah. I like that. I like that term. I haven't really thought about that term. Well, thank you, Brian, again. Uh, and thank you for showing everything that you've done. This is really great. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. Great. Thank you. Yep. Take care.